Amen. You can turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 10 and just hold your finger there for a moment. This weekend at Celebration, part six in this series on honor. You know, it's so frustrating to see how disrespectful and dishonoring we've become in society, in the political arena, on social media, uh, just about everywhere. You know, oh, ooh, it's getting active. Back at you. But it's also frustrating to see how dishonoring believers are towards one another. We're so quick to criticize and judge other ministers, other ministries, like any one of us have figured out the right way uh, to do to reach out to people. Um, I want to share an example of Jesus, how he did ministry. And let me tell you what, Jesus was reckless with the love of God. He reached out, he hung out, he touched people that really angered the religious people. Maybe we ought to be a more, little more reckless with the love of God, more innovative, more creative than ever before. Don't miss this message this weekend. So you're here. You're not going to miss it. Part six to this, on this series of on, this honor series and talking about who's my neighbor. What a great day uh, to look at honor in our community. And thank you, Lisa, again for sharing. Uh, you're definitely bringing, uh, your team is bringing honor to this uh, community. You know, too often we judge people so quickly, um, especially without having walked in their shoes. Uh, we uh, are, are quick to judge. We don't understand maybe what's behind uh, what, what's, what's going on in their lives. Maybe we haven't walked in their shoes. We don't know the struggles that they've been through. We don't know how they were raised. We don't know maybe what uh, things are happening currently. All we see are the after effects. Wow. You know, boy, they're, they're kind of unkind. Uh, man, don't go close to him. He'll, he'll bite your head off. Well, there she goes, right up to her room again. Uh, well, she's a real negative Nelly. I mean, sometimes all we get is um, the, the result of things that are going on behind the scenes that maybe we're not aware of, and it's so easy to, to judge. The truth is there's a reason why people are the way they are. And if we would take the time to get to know them a little bit and get to understand uh, what it is, I believe we'd have more, we'd be more forgiving and we'd be more effective. If we understood, uh, you know, the battles that they've fought, the pain that they're having to endure, maybe the people that have taken advantage of them. No wonder why they're so shut, shut down and, and closed up. You know, but we have to be careful that we're not uh, so quick to judge. You know, maybe they've gone through a divorce or maybe they, they have an addiction that they're battling. Uh, a, a lot, people are going through a lot of things and we don't understand always the, the stress that they're under. So I want to encourage us today, instead of seeing people with eyes of judgment, I want to challenge us to see people with eyes of love and to have more forgiveness, to have more uh, mercy on people, and, and to get to know people and understand their situation. Now, it's easy for me to be happy and be confident and uh, you know, expect great things from God. I, I grew up, I had a great upbringing. I had wonderful parents. Um, I, I've been surrounded by people who love me for all of my life, but there's some people who haven't had that. And oftentimes we're quick to judge, you know, but you know, I mean, think about it, that, that young woman that you want to kind of judge because of the way she dresses, maybe she didn't grow up with parents who loved her unconditionally. Maybe there were people who took advantage of her. See, there's always a story uh, behind where people are. And sometimes that's, people just react in a negative way uh, to things going on in their, in their lives. And the last thing they need from any one of us as, as Jesus followers is to come down on them. You know, one of the things that, uh, one of the coaching models I use when I sit down with a couple or an individual, it's a great coaching model. And if you're a people helper, this is some good little things that, that will help you. But uh, it, it's a model I use often, and it's uh, this formula here. It's uh, P equals P minus I. What that stands for is performance equals potential minus interference. I think we'd all agree that we all have great potential. Maybe you've been told that uh, oftentimes at the beginning of a marriage or just in general, you know, we're excited. We, we see the potential. But oftentimes then the performance, the reality, it's like <laughs> light years apart, right? There's a big gap. Well, why is there a gap? Because there's interference going on. The interference is getting in the way of somebody's potential, and it's creating results that maybe 
are less than we would desire. Uh, case in point, a number of years ago, 2011 actually, David Akers was a kicker for the Philadelphia Eagles. And arguably, he has been known as the best uh, Eagles kicker in their history. Well, it was 2011, and the Eagles were in the playoffs, and a very important game, home field advantage, and unfortunately, Eagle fans, the Green Bay Packers were in town playing the game. In fact, Connie and I were at that game, but we were kind of incognito because, well, I was anyways, because, you know, the reputation for Eagles fans, I mean, it's, it's a tough place for the opposing team and the opposing team's fans. And so I'm like, I'm incognito, not Connie. Connie's like, go Packers, go Packers. You know, it's just way out there. And I'm like, honey, we want to get out of here live, okay? Just chill a little bit. <laughs> well, anyways, the Packers did win, so that made it worse. But how, they, how the Eagles lost was David Akers, a reliable kicker. He missed two field goals, one very makeable, one from 41 yards, one from 34 yards. I mean, makeable field goals. And, and he missed. And I can remember, we're in the stands there. I, people are going, well, get rid of the joker, cut him, let him go, and saying all kinds of negative things against David Akers, this great kicker in, in Eagle history. Well, the thing is that none of us, nobody there, knew the interference that was going on in David Akers' mind. There was something going on that affected his performance. See, his wife and uh, him, they found out two days before the game, two days before the game, that their daughter had cancer. That was the interference. That's what nobody understood. That was the backstory of what was going on, the interference that was going on that caused uh, maybe a lackluster performance. Oftentimes, that's what we get with, in our interaction with people is there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. And if we can come on board as Jesus followers, people who receive the mercy of God, and if we can have more mercy and, and be more forgiving and overlook a fault, give people the benefit of the doubt sometimes. Instead of focusing and magnifying on their weaknesses, uh, you know, look for the best in people. Because everybody has flaws. Everybody uh, has struggles that they've gone through. But the Bible says that love covers a multitude of sins. Love doesn't magnify the sin or the weakness. Love covers that. No greater example in the scriptures than in what we're going to look at in Luke chapter 10 when Jesus confronts some Pharisees and, asks, and is asked of him, who's my neighbor? And that's our topic here today. I want us to look at that passage in Luke chapter 10, but before we get into that, I want you to watch this short little video. Did they just turn on the lights a little bit extra? It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood, a neighborly day for a beauty. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? I have always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you, so let's make the most of this beautiful day. Since we're together, we might as well say, would you be mine, would you be mine, won't you be my neighbor? Won't you please, won't you please, everybody, please, please won't, won't you be my neighbor? Oh, we'll bring out the milk and cookies in just a few moments, all right? Then I just kind of relax you a little bit. Who's my neighbor? There's a tension here that Jesus is going to help us to understand as followers of Jesus about who's our neighbor. Pick it up in uh, verse 25 of chapter 10 with me, if you would. Here's, here's the story. One day, an expert in religious law, who was a Pharisee, stood up to 
test Jesus. So he's going to ask him a question. He's a little disingenuous. You would think he's coming at Jesus to really learn something, but he's just trying to trap Jesus, to test Jesus. And he was a Pharisee, so uh, he was tasked with a big responsibility to interpret the law and to enforce the law. So he had a big role. He had a big job. And uh, he was a very smart person, intimidated people with his knowledge of the law of Moses and all things spiritual. And so he comes to Jesus asking him a question. He says, teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? A great question. I'm sure one that Jesus would love to answer. That was what he was about. His mission was to help people find their way to God. And so he asked him this question, what do I do to inherit eternal life? Next verse. Jesus replied, well, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? How do you interpret? You're an interpreter of the law. <laughs> do you really need to ask me that question? What, what does the law of Moses say? You're an expert. You should really already know the answer, maybe is the implication here. And so the man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind. He just said that from memory. And love your neighbor as yourself. Because that was a very common prayer. This wasn't anything new. Jesus didn't go, wow, I've never heard that before. That is an amazing, and you're so smart. Jesus didn't say that. Because that was something every Jewish person would recite two times a day. It's the Shema. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. It wasn't anything new. He really didn't pat this guy on the back. It was something that uh, you know, everybody knew. And so, uh, apparently, next verse, Jesus gave, said, you know, you're right on. You, you got it right. You're right on. Do this and you will live. In fact, in Matthew 22, where there's a coverage of this story again, Jesus said these words. He said, actually, these two commandments, the entire law, all 600 plus rules and regulations in the Mosaic law are based on these two commandments. You do these two and you get credit for all the rest. It's like if your teacher walked in and said, I've got a hundred question test for you, and here are the questions, but if you just answer these two questions, you get credit for all of them. That'd be pretty great, right? That's basically what he's saying. You know, if you do these two, you know, you're not gonna wanna lie and steal and kill and commit adultery or covet your neighbor's wife. If you, if you love uh, your neighbor as yourself, you're not going to do those other things. If you love the Lord your God with all your heart, you're not going to have idols. You're not going to take the names Lord in vain. You're going to honor the Sabbath. So you do these two commands, you get credit for all the rest. So Jesus was, was saying something very important here. And again, the guy was, uh, maybe it's going over his head or it just didn't quite sink in. But he, he responds with this. He wanted to justify his actions. I guess that wasn't enough. So he asked the question, and who is my neighbor? I wonder what you would answer, who is your neighbor? Well, I, the Eshbox, I love the Eshbox, they're my neighbors. Um, you know, the other people down, they're my neighbors. The person in the next cubicle, they're my neighbor. Uh, uh, other students in my class, they're, they're my neighbors, so to speak. Who's, who's your neighbor? That's what this guy was wondering. Now, the difference maybe without understanding what a neighbor is or, or was is the fact to a Jewish person, a neighbor meant somebody who's just like you, somebody who has the same religion, the same values, the same ethnicity, did the same kind of things, hung out with the same kind of people. To a Jew... A neighbor was somebody who was just like you. Now, that's not uncommon to us. We like to be with people who are similar to us, right or wrong. Uh, sometimes we get a narrow world view when it's just always the same people. But, um, you know, we, we're like that. We, uh, we like to be around people who share some of the same values. I mean, you came to a Christian church today. You don't go to the Church of Satan you, you, you came to, you know, with people who generally believe the same. You didn't take your kids to a bar to hang out. No, you, you took them to church. You took them to Fun Fest, right? Because we share some of the same values. We're kind of heading in the right direction. So in a way, 
uh, you know, we're, we're like that. We kind of hang out with our, with our own kind. Um, so, but their understanding of neighbor was a little bit different. And that's why, you know, in the Jewish community, they built a strong bond of community. Maybe it's similar to what the Amish do today. They're real connected. They depend on each other. Maybe the Mormon community does, does that. You got to do business with the same kind of people. That's their idea of a neighbor was people who are just like them. And so to answer this question, Jesus now really, really brings attention to their, this, uh, their understanding, the audience's understanding, the, the, the Pharisee and maybe the other people listening. He brings a real uh, apparent attention here. So he replies with a story. He tells a parable. A parable is a made-up story. It's not real. But uh, he, he tells this story, and so he says, a Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. Now, that's not uncommon back in the first century. We were there in Israel a couple years ago, and that road from Jerusalem to Jericho is very difficult. In fact, you can see it there. There's me perched on that overlook, and, and you can see how rugged it is. It's not just a nice casual trail. You would never travel that road alone back in that time because there, there would be possibility of being uh, you know, robbed or, or whatever. And so it's a very difficult road. And, and so when the, the audience is listening to Jesus tell this story, go ahead and go back to that verse, that he's traveling from Jerusalem, he was attacked by bandits. So really, they weren't surprised by that, because yeah, that could really happen. And what happened is they stripped him of his clothes, they beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. So this guy was in tough shape. He was a Jewish man. He was stripped and beaten and laying alongside the road. Uh, next verse. So by chance, a priest came along, a holy person, somebody, you know, who was really high up in the minds of people. He came along, but when he saw the man lying there, look what he did. He crossed to the other side of the road and, and passed him by. I mean, he completely avoided this man, uh, you know, a Jewish man, one of his fellow brothers uh, who was broken, beaten, half dead. He, he completely avoided him. And guess, probably the worst thing about it is their religion taught them to do that. Their religion taught them to do this because it's actually against religious law for a priest to touch a dead body, presuming maybe he was dead. If he touched him, he would be unclean. He'd have to go through a ceremonial washing and he would be distracted from maybe the mission that he was on to help others. So their religion taught them to avoid others. We look at it and say, wow, that's kind of weird. But you know what? We do the same thing in ways. You know, we, we tell people, go out and win the world for Jesus, but come out from among them, separate yourself. How's that going to work? We tell our, our students, you know, win your high school for Jesus, but don't hang out with them. You know, and I'm all for boundaries, and we taught our girls boundaries, certain friendships you don't want to have in your life. And again, they make their own choices when they get to that point, but we've nurtured them in that way, and that, that's, that's a good thing to do. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, but how often do we just insulate and isolate ourselves from the very people, the broken and the messy people, that God wants to reach through us. And here, their religion taught them to do that. And it's oftentimes, we stay away from broken people. We stay away from people with differing lifestyles, uncomfortable lifestyles. Why aren't we raising modern-day Davids to run fearlessly into the, to the giants of our culture? I know that's what Pastor Luke and Angela are doing. They, they're trying to raise young men and women who, who got a strong faith in God, and they can go into those environments and not be swayed uh, left and right. But they've, they've got a, a spiritual backbone, and they know what they believe. And I've heard Luke preach. If you ever, on Instagram, you, they they. They, they list it or they put it out there. Man, tune in and see what is being taught to our students. You'd be impressed. You'd be empowered to know that that's being taught to our students. And why not raise a generation who doesn't shy away from the very places God has called us to? Yeah, that's, that's, what, I, that's what I want. Because Jesus, he was like this. He wasn't afraid of broken and messy people. 
and neither should we. So we find out that this Samaritan, this Samaritan, there we go, despised Samaritan. Now I know the, the, the title of the, the section of this story, it says the good Samaritan. Well, that's not an inspired part of the scriptures. That's just, you know, something that was added later for a reference point. That's not part of the original writing. It says the good Samaritan. Well, <laughs> to the Jewish person, a Samaritan wasn't good. That's kind of an oxymoron there. Yeah. The Jewish people viewed Samaritans as uh, terrible. They, they, they hated them because they were a mixed breed. You know, they intermarried and they, they mixed their religion, and so they were actually an impure people uh, when it came to the Jewish people. And in fact, if they were going a certain direction and it would take them through Samaria, they wouldn't go through Samaria. They'd go around it because they wanted to avoid Samaria at all cost. So here, this Samaritan, he was moved with compassion. But what we're going to find out, it wasn't just a feeling of compassion. He coupled that compassion with action. And that's what takes compassion to a whole nother level. It's great to feel bad and to feel compassion. But if it's not coupled with action, it's really useless. And so this Samaritan had compassion, just like Jesus had compassion. Jesus was ministering, I mean, nonstop, around the clock, he had quieted the, the Sea of Galilee, and, and he, they, he, you know, they had been working hard, so he said, come on, disciples, let's, let's, go, let's get away from the crowd. But they couldn't get away because the crowd was there, and so Jesus was moved with compassion, and he said, come on, let's feed these people. Jesus was often moved with compassion. We ought to be moved with compassion. And I, that's one of the things I love about our church. We are compassionate people. We do all kinds of things. We partner with New Hope. We have a connecting point. We're coming alongside, filling in the gaps in our community. And any outreach we do, you guys are all on board. You're great givers. You're great servers. I know this is a church with great compassion, and I'm proud of you for it. We've, we've brought action to compassion, and that's what this Samaritan did. And so what he did was going over to him, the Samaritan, look what he did. He soothed his wounds. You would think that he would spit at the guy. You know, he, he's a Samaritan who's, who's been despised, and here's a, a Jewish person there, half dead. You think he just, you know, puts salt in his wounds. <laughs> but he doesn't do that. It says that he soothed his wounds with olive oil. Why olive oil? Olive oil, is, was, there's a healing ointment. It's a healing ointment. It, 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 cre it helped with the healing process. And with wine. Why wine? Because wine served as a anti, uh, anti antiseptic, what is it called? <laughs> Against the infection. They didn't have the antibacterial rub back then. So the alcohol content in wine would actually uh, get rid of infection. And maybe they gave him some to drink, too, to kind of numb the pain. I don't know. The text doesn't say that. But, it, you know, it's, he soothed his wounds with oil and with wine, and he bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey. That was his ride. So he gave up his ride for this Jewish person that maybe had caused harm to his people for generations. But he, he gave him his ride. He, he allowed that man to take his place. And then he took him to the inn, a place to heal. You know, churches ought to be a place to heal. A place for the broken, a place for the messy. And if that's the case, this is going to be a messy place. But that's okay, because that's the kind of, that's the kind of, place that we're, we're a hospital. We're not a museum that, that displays masterpiece works of art. No, we're the canvas. We're, we got paint all over the place. People coloring outside the lines. Uh, you know, people that don't really feel valuable like a masterpiece, more like misfits. But we're to be a place where people can come and people can be healed and people can experience something amazing. That's the kind of, in fact, Jesus is the one who said, it, it's the sick who needs a doctor, not the well. It's a place for 
It's a workshop, God's workshop to put people back together, broken things back together, to repurpose some things. We're really to be a hospital. And then we find out that, you know, he, he took care of them. He didn't just drop them off at New Hope and say, okay, I got them here. No, it says he took care of them. He soothed his wounds, he did all those things, but he, he took care of them and he paid the guy's debts. He said, listen, if, if what I've given you isn't enough, hey, I'll pay the rest later. He paid the price for this man. I want to ask you this morning, who in this story do you identify with? I, I can identify with the, the Good Samaritan. I feel like I've been a giving person. I've helped a lot of people. And you probably too can think, yeah, I, you know, I've been a giving person. I've, I've helped people. I really have. I think we can identify with being the Good Samaritan. But I'll be honest, I can identify with being the priest too. Or the temple assistant. I've passed by people many times. I didn't want to be inconvenienced. I didn't want it to be made comfortable. I had other things to do. And so I've just kind of walked right by on the other side. I've even talked myself out of helping people. Thinking, well, I've helped them before. I don't want to enable them. So let, you know, they need to learn their lesson. And I know there's wisdom and in, in, in sometimes our compassion can be misguided and but thank God for organizations that like, like New Hope and, and just the hearts of people in this church who, you know, we're concerned. We don't want to just give a handout. We want to help people up. But here, who, who do you identify with? Do you identify with a broken man, half dead? Well, guess what? None of us are the heroes in this story. We're all that broken man at some point in our lives. And the sooner you get to that broken place where you finally humble yourself and realize that you can't do it on your own, the better off you'll be and the quicker you'll be to get up on your feet. How long, how broken do you have to be before you finally surrender or surrender again? Because you kind of got a little bit arrogant or you felt like you didn't need God, you're going to do this thing on your own. This is a place that Calvary levels the whole playing field at this place of brokenness. So we're all this man, this broken man. There's one thing I was reading or came to mind when I was reading this this week that I never really considered before is that Jesus is actually the Good Samaritan. He's actually telling a story about himself. I never saw that before. But you think about it. Look at this. The Samaritans were mixed race, half-breed, what you call, whatever you call it. They, they would have called it then. Jesus, he was half, half-breed, so to speak. He was God, and he was man. And he was rejected by his own people rejected and despised by his own people. The wine would be Jesus' blood. That, 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 that blood was for the forgiveness of sins. That, that, that would take out the infection of sin that was deep in the heart of man. The oil is the anointing of the Holy Spirit that covers and that begins a work from the inside out. A work that doesn't, uh, doesn't compel you for behavior modification so that you can fit in with everybody else who's like you. That's religion. But something more that starts a work on the inside that changes things. It's like a, a heart transplant. So he was, he was the oil. And the donkey represents the fact that the Samaritan gave up his place on the donkey. Jesus gave up his place in heaven to come and be the vehicle for people to find forgiveness and to find God. And then, as the Samaritan paid this man's debt, what did Jesus do? He paid our debt by going to the cross. He died so that we could live. He paid the debt, and he continues to pay that debt even after. And then... As the story goes, 
The man replied, the one who showed him mercy is the one who's my neighbor. Now Jesus said, now go and do the same. Go and be like me. Think about that for a moment. He said, now go. Now go. That means that our most effective ministry is not what happens right here on Sunday morning. It's what we receive here in inspiration and being empowered and equipped to go out. Because guess what? we got to go get them. They're not coming. Statistics prove that people are running farther from church in general than they're coming. They're not beating down the doors to get in here. So we got to go get them. we got to go get them. And sometimes in going to get them, we'll be criticized by the religious people who say, why, why are you, aren't you compromising? Why, why are you reaching out to this person? Why are you doing this? And why are you hanging out there and easily be criticized by the religious people? But I've determined I'm not going to be so quick to judge as maybe I have been in the past. As I said in that video, sometimes we, we criticize other ministers and other ministries so quickly I've been reminded through this honor series, touch not thine anointed. Be careful with what we speak about other people, and especially those who, who bring the good news. They may bring it differently, and it may be something that challenges us, but I'm not going to be the one to, to criticize and, and be so judgmental. And, uh, you know, I, I want to I bring more understanding and more healing and more restoration and bring encouragement to those who are discouraged. It was a while ago, <laughs> I had somebody come to me after the service and they, and they said, Pastor Mike, that was one hell of a sermon. <laughs> you know, that didn't offend me at all because I thought it was a pretty good sermon too. <laughs> you know... <laughs> I could tell he wasn't raised the way I was raised. In fact, in my home, if you, were, if you said that word, it meant you were going there, okay? I found out that on Sundays, he was raised going to the flea markets. So while I was raised going to church, he was raised going to the flea markets. So easy just to be so judgmental and be so offended by that instead of understanding that person. They come from a different place. They're at, they're at a different place. And we can either choose to look through eyes of judgment or eyes of love, trying to understand the background. It reminds me of such a, a beautiful story I heard about a little boy on his way home from school. He saw a sign on the, the farmer's gate, uh, puppies for sale. So he went home and said, Mom, I, 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 can, I, can I buy uh, one of these puppies? And she's like, oh, okay, that's, yeah, that, that'd be fine. And so he empties out his piggy bank and gets his money in his hand. He goes back to this farmer and he says, I'd, I'd like to buy one of your puppies. How much are they? And the farmer said, well, how much do you have, son? And the little boy said, I got 39 cents. And the farmer said, perfect. So he took him to the barn, opened up the barn door, and there were six or so, half a dozen little bouncy, fluffy puppies. And he was like, oh, wow, this is so wonderful. Who, which one do I choose? And the farmer was like, well, which one do you want? And he soon noticed that there was one more little puppy making its way to where the others are, but it had a noticeable hobble, a limp in its leg. And that little boy pointed to that one and said, I want that one. The farmer said, what? You got all these beautiful little puppies. Why do you want that one? At that moment, the boy pulled up his pant leg to reveal braces on his legs. And he said, you know what? I don't run very well either. I think he's going to need somebody who understands. You know, this world is filled with people who needs somebody to understand, not to correct, not to fix. I mean, we want to we wanna help them get on their way and find, uh, find a life in obedience with God and in alignment with His will. And, but sometimes it takes time. Sometimes it takes that just understanding because we've got a wonderful lifeboat here. 
know you're wondering, what in the world is this boat about? No, we're not going to auction it off. <laughs> when you're out in the water and you don't have a life preserver, you've been treading water for a while, you're getting tired. When one of these comes by, you're thankful to have a lifeboat. How many of you have experienced a lifeboat with Jesus being our Savior? Yeah, so many of us. Well, would you help me for a moment? Come on. Some of you, come on up here. Let's get in this lifeboat. Come on. Don and Debbie. Come on, Beth, Tim. Come on in here. Come on, Robin, Connie. Anybody. Come on. Yeah. Aaron, come on up here. You bet. Let's fill this lifeboat. There's plenty of room. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there's room for more. Come on, Charlie, Deanna. Come on. Come on up here. Yeah, Luke, come on. Some of you, get over here. Why, why are you sitting there? Come on, get in here. We need some of you over here. Get in this lifeboat. Man, it's so weird. Yeah, okay. <laughs> come on, how many? We need. We got room for more. Uh, Shermans, come on. Come on over here in the, in the lifeboat. Brian, James, come on, James. Come on, yeah. Yeah, there's plenty of room. Look at this. You better stand because we got to fit more people in. <laughs> you know, you're in the captain's chair. Wait. <laughs> oh, yeah. Careful, it's, it's starting to tip a little bit. Come on, we need some more. Rhoda, come on, there's room for you right here. Come on, come on. Mike, come on, I see you there. Come on, Mike, you got a captain's beard. Hey, let's give the spot. Come on, Mike, Mike, come on. Okay, he can be the captain. He's got that captain look. Okay. There we go, look at that. Come on in, John. There's room. There's room. Can't we fit one more? Can we fit a couple more? Some of you would long for your daughter or son to be in this lifeboat. Some of you got a mom or a dad who's far from God that you would hope would be in this lifeboat. When will we realize that it's not about us? It's about those who haven't found their way into the lifeboat yet. I don't know, I think, I think we could maybe squeeze some more. Should we put some more in here? Or, or maybe, maybe we need a bigger boat. Maybe that's why we got this big audacious goal with 40 acres and maybe creating a bigger lifeboat. I, I don't know, maybe, maybe, that's, maybe that's it. Or maybe we need more boats, forget that. Maybe we need more boats. Forgive us, God, for saying, well, we have enough. Who would ever say that this lifeboat is big enough? And that's why we need to partner together. That's why we need to say, you know what? We're never done until he parts that sky and comes to take his church home. We got to be out. We got to be going out to call those who need to be in this lifeboat. I know you're thinking of somebody right now. A family member, a friend somebody that they feel like a misfit, somebody they're so broken. And they would never really walk in here because it's just not their environment. Who comes to mind when you think about this lifeboat? With every head bowed and every eye closed here this morning. If you're here this morning and you say, I need to be in that lifeboat. I've been doing my own thing. I need to finally, I'm tired of being broken. I don't know how much more broken I can be. I need to surrender my life to Jesus. I need to give him my life. I need to let him save me. I need to let him, let me get into that boat. If you're here this morning, you just say, Pastor Mike, that's me. I want to pray for you. Would you just slip up your hand and say, that's me. I want to pray. You, need, you know you need to get in this lifeboat. You're not saved. Just slip up your hand. I want to pray for you. Where are you? Don't wait another year. Don't wait another decade. Don't wait for life to completely fall apart. Maybe you're here this morning and you were once in this lifeboat, but you just got out 
Just like Peter got out of the boat, he took his eyes off Jesus and he began to sink. And you've taken your eyes off Jesus. You decided, I'm just going to do my own thing. I can do it without God. I don't really need him in my life. I don't need to go to church anymore. I, I'm just, I'm fine without you, God. But you're realizing how fast you're sinking down. And it's time for you to return to the lifeboat. He's throwing out a line to you right now. Are you going to reject it? Are you going to drown? Or is it time for you to come back to Jesus? Jesus, say, I, I need to be saved. I've went my own way. I need you, God. If you're here today, and at one time maybe you you felt like you were in the light, but you've done your own thing, you've turned away from God, and you say, today, this is my day to cut back into the lifeboat. Slip your hand wherever you are. Just slip it up. Wherever you are, this is your day. This is your moment. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Okay. Praise God. Hallelujah. One more appeal today. If you know of somebody that's come to your heart and mind, together we're going to pray for them right now. I'm lifting my hand. I've got family members who need to be in this boat. How about you? Slip it up. If you're thinking about somebody right now, we're going to pray together. Why don't you stand with me and let's lift up a prayer for them right now. Father, we thank you. God, we thank you. Thank you for giving us salvation. We didn't uh, deserve it. We didn't uh, have a part in, in making it happen, Lord. Your Holy Spirit has called us. We have responded, and we are in this lifeboat. But, Lord, I long for someone to be there with me. And right now, Father, I speak their name to you right now. God, be with so-and-so right now. May your Holy Spirit travel the miles. May, be, may your Holy Spirit stop them in their tracks wherever they are. They may be the farthest place from a church or for a, from a gospel message, but your Holy Spirit can reach them now. And so, God, we just pray right now for them. We lift their name to you. You haven't forgot about them. But, Lord, we pray, God, that your Spirit will have a work in their heart right now. And we commit them to you in the name of Jesus.